Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. We are one of three IAC domains under the DOD Information Analysis Centers, operated under DTIC, or the Defense Technical Information Center within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. As such, our organization supports those working in cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. Uh, we do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We also provide research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from the government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope that you enjoy this webinar and it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems, science, and technology. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, uh, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Second, all participants are muted, uh, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat during the webinar. However, if you have a, a question for the presenter um, that we will host during the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience question tool at the top center of your screen. That is gonna be the icon that looks like a chat bubble. That's right next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those that are dialed in on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. Um, if you guys have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back to the CSI website in a day or two, and once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. With that said, I will hand it off uh, to Mr. John Silly. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm John Chilly, and I'll be presenting today the Data Science Machine Learning Enabled Terminal Effects Optimization. Um, before we get started, there's one question in the chat from David about he's not getting the audio. Okay, no problem. I'll, okay. I'll try to, to work with them. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm a computer scientist uh, at Picatinny Arsenal in the Systems Analysis Division. Um, I have my background in uh, computer science from East Stroudsburg University, and I've been working at Picatinny Arsenal for a little bit over a year now. So to get into the weeds of all this, so the agenda today. So what are the issues with our current workflow that we have? Um, how are we going to solve them? Um, why are we going to do this? And then also in the future, what progress are we going to make from what we've already learned about this process and then the future development and our plans for that. So this is our current iterative design loop right now. So we kind of get some requirements from a customer and then we go to our performance division. We get some performance data that we can then plug into our in-house model we tweak and optimize the parameters depending on what we see with the output. We gather the the outputs then, and then within the decision branch, we usually create some kind of like trade study where then we can then give back to the customer and then compare against the previous requirements they gave us and then just continue this loop until the customer is satisfied with our product. Um, then we'll go into some issues. So. Some issues is that um, during the early phases when you're exploring like an entire trade space, it's usually like typically very large. So you spend a lot of time exploring the edges of this um, or exploring areas where you aren't really getting a lot of information very quickly. Um, and then also we see a lot of inaccuracies with sharp physics changes. So let's say if you go from like subsonic to supersonic, it's not able to model that very well. So we've decided to figure out some paths within the machine learning and AI realm and statistics realm of how to solve these issues that we've found from interviewing with our uh, colleagues and other analysts. 
So what's our purpose? So we see the growing field of AI and ML, uh, and we want to apply that to workflows. We see it all over the DoD as well as the private sector as well. Um, and this will greatly decrease our computational costs and time and improve our efficiency on, on delivering our products to our customer, as well as not only increase time, it also uh, increase the detail and the fidelity of our data so we can dive deeper into exactly the questions that they want to know in the certain trade space and the certain elements of their questions that they are asking. So hopefully we can, at the end, get some innovative designs, uh, rapid conceptualization of the product in the uh, trade space and uh, exploit our past studies to further inform our current study at hand. So this is what we've uh, decided to come up with. So you can see our current design loop right here, that circle in like the middle of the page. And then at the top left, we want to create some kind of historical database. So right now we kind of have some kind of like semi-structured data that we can pull from, but it's not in one centralized place, nor can we query from it like we can a large data warehouse or a data lake. Uh, the other part of this is the DOE. So the historical database can inform our DOE. So I'll get into more what a DOE is in the in further slides, but a DOE is a design of experiments. It's a, it's a statistical way to uh, choose specific points within uh, your model to get the most amount of data without with the least amount of runs, essentially. And it'll eventually create some kind of neural network and some surrogate model. So you can um, use that to without running the entire process all over again. And then the bottom right is our Bayesian optimization and machine learning uh, loop. So I'll get into what Bayesian optimization is in further slides. So historical data. So we'll get into this first. So, so what we really want is a large SQL database. Uh, so it can be a data lake, which is raw data. Um, or we can create a data warehouse, which takes that raw data and it creates a pipeline to make it more structured and more easily queried. Uh, that pipeline is probably going to be pretty expensive, so it depends on funding and timing and resources, depending on which route we go. But this will really help us track between projects. So a lot of times it's on different computers, on CDs or wherever, so it's not in one centralized place that you can go and pull data from. Um, so we'll have some kind of like SQL uh, query search or NoSQL search uh, that will able to allow us to pull data from our past research. So then we don't have to do redundant studies and we can save a lot of time on that. And also increase the lifetime that we can store data because a lot of times um, like we'll just have stuff in random places. They somewhat get lost and stuff, but like um, not lost, but it, it's, is a lot more difficult to find. So we can store data for a much longer period of time. And then we'll go into design of experiments. So design of experiments is a, it's a way that you can explore the relationships between inputs and outputs. So there are many different uh, space filling designs within design of experiments. So one would be like an edge filling design. So you choose the maximum value for each of the var input variables that you have. So say you just have like a 2D, uh, only two inputs. So you can imagine it just on like a, on an X, Y plane, uh, you just pick the four corners and it gives you the most amount of information to explore the corners. And then you can then dive deep into maybe a full factorial once you actually understand the response surface that you're getting from uh, the design of experiments. So it'll, it'll greatly increase uh, our trade because right now what we're doing is a lot of full factorial uh, grid searches, which uh, is computationally expensive. And we, we can also do within design of experiments like a sparse search and many a lot of different ways that we can explore the space um, without having to do the full factorial of input uh, parameters. So now we're going to get into Bayesian optimization. Um, so this is in the bottom right. So then with Bayesian optimization, you have two components. So on the top right here, you're going to see your surrogate model. Um, so a surrogate model is approximating uh, what's actually going on uh, within your 
design loop within our design loop. And then our acquisition functions is telling us where to probe next. So you can see um, the light blue, that's going to be our uh, confidence bound. Um, so as long as your circuit model has something that has a confidence interval or confidence bound, you can use it as a surrogate model. In our acquisition function, depending on what, whether you want to maximize or minimize, you're going to find either the absolute maximum or absolute mis minimum. And this, in this uh, example, is going to be an absolute uh, maximum we're going to probe. So you can see where the red line is right here. So it tells us we get the most amount of information at about like almost right below three. So then we probe our surrogate model there. And this is very good for uh, black box models or noisy models or expensive to compute models because um, you don't, it it accounts for noise when you're uh, doing it within Python and it also allows for less runs uh, in total. So yeah, I just touched on the acquisition function in the last slide. So um, it takes, uh, your previous runs and learns from that. And it changes based on what it's learned from your pre previous runs. One problem with this is that it can't be really run in parallel. It's mostly a serial process, but you get a lot of data from your past runs. And it's kind of like, that's how this approach goes. So right here, I'm going to just click through. Um, it will show um, how this Bayesian optimization works at a high level. So right here, we have our surrogate model at the top with our confidence bounds. We've only probed uh, the minimum, the maximum, and some midpoint right here. And then down here, we have our acquisition function, which is just our upper confidence bound of our uh, surrogate model right here. So we find our absolute maximum within our acquisition function right here. And then we're going to want to probe at that point. And then once we probe at that point, uh, you can see our confidence bounds adjust and also our surrogate model adjusts uh, based on us probing at that point of 0.57. So next, we're going to find the next absolute maximum right here. And then we're going to probe at that point again. And we're going to continue this process until we're... You can, you can stop the process whenever you want. It can be the number of iterations. It can be uh, a 90% confidence interval. Right here, it's going to be a 95% confidence interval. So as, as long as our maximum point is above our 95% confidence interval bound, then we'll be satisfied. So as long as this point is above any of the blue right here, which we'll get to soon. So oh, right here. So right here, we are 95% confident that at 0.22, it, this is going to be your absolute maximum for our surrogate model. So with this, you can explore over as many um, input variables as you want, and you can search as an, an integer-like, or you can do continuous, or you can do categorical, and you can set for as many iterations as you would like as well. And it will give you... it'll. At the end, it will give you a model score. And as long as you can maximize that model score, let's say it's like you want to maximize uh, acceleration. So it will just it will find the point based on the parameters or the maximum acceleration for that model. And then this all feeds back into the uh, current design loop that we were talking about before. So instead of having to run this loop um, as a full factorial multiple times, design of experiments, Bayesian optimization, which are fed through historical data can tell us exactly what cases to run. So we don't have to run a full factorial of every single case that our customer would like. We can kind of dive into uh, the important points within our, our decision. So then what tools do we use? So we use Python, uh, high, high, high level general purpose uh, programming language. Uh, most people are probably familiar with that. We use uh, Jupyter, Jupyter Labs, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so it's a easy way to create and share documents. And Jupyter Labs uh, interfaces very well with Dask, which is a, a, a library for distributed computing. So what that does is it distributes workers to your your code and it can, and it allows parallel processing. And then Holoviews is how we visualize a lot of our graphics. Uh, so it's an interactive, uh, you have a lot of interactive graphs. 
You can also, within Hall of Views, you can use Panels, which is a dashboarding app that we may, may have as a path forward. Then Psychic Optimize is how we use our Gaussian process. So you can, within Psychic Optimize, there's this function called GP Minimize, and we use that to run our Gaussian process. So what we've done, we've gone to the lab um, and we brought all this from the low side to the high side. Uh, we're currently working on bringing the design of experiments into current pro uh, uh, into current products and seeing how that, uh, if it's worth the time to learn how to work this into our workflow. And then we're also uh, currently working on the ba Bayesian optimization part. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble with uh, interfacing, interfacing Dask with the HPC, but that is a route forward. And um, we're hopefully in the future able to get this running on most of our projects. So for the future, yeah, hopefully we can uh, use this uh, to optimize our workflow. We can do some trade space visualization with hollow views or panels, and we can characterize some of our deficiencies within our workflow for uh, a faster turnaround rate. And then uh, any questions, I guess, uh, there's some questions in the chat. Thank you for that presentation. Um, we don't have any questions just yet that have been entered, um, but at a, at a very high level, can you speak to, I have a couple of quick questions myself to kind of maybe help get the Q&A started. Can you speak at a very high level of some of the use cases for this work? Um, you sp obviously you drill down into the details of it, but just at a very high level, some of the use cases for the work. And then, and then the separate follow-up question I have, um, in the field of machine learning, um, lots of times, um, you know, that the, the, there's the saying that, you know, there's garbage in, garbage out. Can you speak to some of the, I guess, constraints or some of the requirements for the training data sets that you guys use? Over. Okay. So at a high level, so let's say I'll use a car as an example. So let's say you want to get the fastest car possible. So that'll be your your Gaussian process score right there. So you have all these input parameters. So you have weight of the car, you have what kind of engine it has. You have um, uh, like, I'm not great with cars, but like how many uh, gears it has, et cetera. So you have all these all these inputs going in. So you can say, okay, I want to search from a weight of 1,000 to 10,000. I want to search from having a V4 engine all the way up to a V8 engine. And then I want to search on within all those parameters. So each run is going to probe at a certain one of those points within those input spaces. And then eventually it will find what combination of all those input spaces within the bounds that you've given it uh, which will give you the maximum speed for your vehicle. That makes sense. I was trying to think of a <laughs> a high level, like unclass uh, version of that. No, I'm tracking. I'm following. Um, okay. Also, can you also speak to, um, I guess the the time associated with some of this work or the level of effort associated? Um, you know, we, we speak about doing multiple runs. Um, how long? um do these take roughly um how big of a project or undertaking is this is is this going going to be over so when you're saying time it takes are you talking about our current process or the time it takes to research uh how to go about this work this new workflow um if you could speak to both i think that would be helpful for uh, our listeners okay so with our current design process it really depends on on like on the project and stuff is very dependent, but it can take runs can take like two to four weeks. So uh, that's like very timely, especially when you're going to have to do this design loop multiple times. Um, so then as far as this current effort, uh, this has been uh, an in-house laboratory research for about a year now. And uh, we've gotten the DOE on in on some things, uh, the basing optimization is still out there. And then as far as the database, that's still in the works as well. So 
I, I'd say, depending on how many resources you have for this kind of work, if you have a lot of resources, it can go a lot faster. If you don't have as many, then it take a little bit longer, but I'd say a year to two years. Thank you. Um, I'm monitoring the chat as of right now. I don't see any additional questions. Um, I did have one. I just lost my train of thought as you were uh, giving giving that response. Um, so, so you guys are still early on. Um, do you have, you know, you spoke about the database that you have in development now. Do you guys have a time frame for when that will be completed? Over. Um, none that I know that I can speak on. Understood. <laughs> Understood. No problem there. Um, okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate I appreciate the uh, the presentation today. Um, we don't have any questions as of right now. Um, we'll hold on for uh, a couple of minutes. Um, this one re went relatively quick uh, this month, just to see if we have any other questions. Uh, I want to give the the attendees a chance um, to interact if they if they so choose. Sounds good. So, so, so you also hinted at during your presentation that um, you have moved some of this work to the high side as well. Um, I'm sure there were there were many challenges um, with that as well. Um, just to confirm, you're, you're speaking about on on Cipra, correct? Um, no, not, not on Zipper. Okay. I see a question. I think. Yes, we do have one comment. Um, it says regarding the Bayesian optimization with the iterations and model scores being configurable. Is the accuracy threshold something the operator determines? Okay, so yeah, when you're talking about for your surrogate model, um, the bounds that you have. So like in my example in here, um, it was like 95%. Um, yeah, you can change that your error bounds to whatever you the user wants. And then also on top of that, you can choose how many, how many, uh, like epochs you want to do so like the minimum is 10 but you can go up to as many as you want depending on how much time you have and how much computing power you have and that will increase your accuracy because it'll be able to uh search the space a lot uh a lot more so epochs are just iterations thank you and I believe that was the last question that we have. I don't foresee any other questions as of right now. Um, but just as a reminder to, to everybody on the line, uh, this recorded webinar will be up on YouTube as well as MillTube uh, within a couple of days. Um, the attendees also have your contact information, so feel free to um, reach directly to him or to CSI if you have any other further questions. Um, that just didn't come to mind necessarily right now during our presentation. Um, but with that said, uh, I would like to thank you for your time. Um, we will have our next uh, webinar presentation, I believe April 6th, we are confirming, confirming the date um, as of right now, which will be on do-it-yourself uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so we hope to see you, see everybody back online uh, next month. Thank you all. Thank you for having me.